Thank you, Doris, uh, and thank you to the festival for having me here. I'm delighted to be here, and thank you all for getting up early on a Sunday. I was reluctant. Um, you know, this is a particularly um, sort of auspicious place for me to be giving you this talk because my father really wanted me to go to law school. So somewhere up in heaven, my dad is looking down saying, see, I told you. So here you go, dad. Um, I actually want to begin today um, with a short video that I think will sort of get us in the mood of talking about Rin Tin Tin. So please go ahead. I was working on a, a magazine piece about animal actors in Hollywood. And if you begin researching animal actors, inevitably Rin Tin Tin's name will come up. His name popped up and I can still picture the moment where I saw it and had the reaction of, oh my God, Rin Tin Tin. I hadn't thought about Rin Tin Tin in, in literally in decades. My memory of him was merely that he was a television character in my early childhood. I remember there was this figurine on my grandfather's desk and we were never allowed to play with it. But I spent so many years of my childhood wondering why did my grandfather have this Rin Tin Tin figurine? Why was it so important to him? The idea that this character actually spanned countries and lifetimes and generations entranced me and the story just blossomed. Lee Duncan was a young man in the U.S. Army in World War I. At one point, he was sent to examine a structure that had been hit by artillery. He knew that it was probably a dog kennel. In the very back of the kennel, he came upon a female who had just given birth to a litter of puppies. There was a deep loneliness that he had, and what he found that was inviolable was his connection to his dog. I think everyone has the persistent dream of the perfect friend, the friend who would always be there, the friend who would always be your companion and your protector and your intimate. And I think audiences stepped into that same relationship with the dog. Lee believed that Rin Tin Tin could be the greatest star in Hollywood, and it turned out he was right. Rin Tin Tin became one of the first globally recognized American stars. The feeling of Rin Tin Tin as a heroic dog sort of lifted out of the material world and became conceptual. It was about an idea that a dog could be a hero. And Rin Tin Tin was a hero and was looked upon as a hero by people all over the world. He won the very first Oscar for Best Actor, which was then not awarded to him because the Academy thought it would look strange to give Best Actor to a dog. I think audiences saw him as that ideal friend who'd do anything, save you, and then still cuddle up with you at the end of the day. And that was being proliferated in merchandise, and comic books, on television, in movies. It, it spread into something really magical and far bigger than just one dog owned by one guy. Red Tin Tin. Who is Red Tin Tin? I knew he'd come. When you think about writing about a dog, your idea is that it's, it's kind of a lark. It's something fun and funny, and you would never imagine that it would draw you through two world wars, through some life stories that have fairly dark turns. So much of this story is about what we remember and what lasts, especially when most of what comes in and out of our lives 
doesn't last. Everything that matters to us somehow connects to this very simple idea, which is, is something mortal or immortal? Is it something that can live on in some way, or is it evanescent, is it gone? The National Biscuit Company presents The Adventures of Rin Tin Tin. Rin Tin Tin was one of those surprising characters that managed to keep living on. It really is about falling in love with an idea and making it last forever. You know, I feel like that video is so good, I almost don't have to say anything now. <laughs> Lee Duncan, who was the young GI who found this orphan puppy in 1918, loved to use this particular phrase, there will always be a Rin Tin Tin. I've thought about that a lot and tried to figure out what did he mean exactly? Obviously, he didn't mean that the original dog that he owned would live forever. But he did mean that in many ways, this idea could live in perpetuity. That a dog could, in a way that a person could not, be replicated and live on through its offspring and in the case of Rin Tin Tin, more particularly through the idea that he embodied. What amazed me about the story of Rin Tin Tin was the way that our relationship with dogs it, it provides almost a perfect way of looking at the history of our culture. Let me just bring you back to 1918. What were dogs the role of dogs in our lives in 1918 when Rin Tin Tin was originally found. Very, very different. In 1918, the United States was largely an agrarian society. People lived on farms. They had dogs, and dogs lived outside. The dogs had jobs. They herded cattle. They guarded the sheep. They weren't really pets, and the idea of a pet wasn't as much a part of our culture as it is now when people take their dog for acupuncture and um, cosmetic surgery, and I'm not kidding. <laughs> it was a very different time in our lives, and Rin Tin Tin, when he first came into the public eye, was not as a pet dog, but as a heroic figure. Now, it's sort of interesting that a dog could be a hero. And to me, understanding that was so key to what this book was all about. Why are dogs able to be heroic? Well, to begin with, dogs are not people. When you look at people who are heroic, inevitably there is something about them that undermines their heroic stature. Dogs can be perfect. You, if you're a, a movie star and you play heroes, then the magazines begin gossiping about you're a drunk, you're an adulterer, you, you, all of your imperfections get revealed. Dogs don't drink. <laughs> the worst thing that was ever said about Rin Tin Tin was that he, well, he was ill-tempered. He actually bit everybody, um, <laughs> including, and not insignificantly, Jack Warner, who, um, who actually hated the dog and, 
as did Daryl Zanuck, who wrote many of the early Rintintin screenplays. I mean, he, he was not a friendly dog. He was a one-man dog who, from birth, practically, was inseparable from Lee Duncan. And the theory of dog training at that time, which was actually rather primitive, was if you wanted a dog to be obedient, you couldn't allow anyone other than the trainer to handle the dog. So Rinton Tin was never played with anybody other than Lee, never was petted by people other than Lee. In fact, in the mid-1920s, Lee was out with Rinton Tin in Boston, and a woman, I mean, at this point, Rinton Tin was a huge movie star. He, all of his films were immediate bestseller box office ex bonanzas. And a woman was walking um, through the Boston Common and saw Lee with Rin Tin Tin and reached out to pet him. And he snapped at her. She was also, by the way, carrying her pet chihuahua in the sleeve of her coat. Um, this resulted in a lawsuit in which she sued Lee for the cost of the coat, the trauma to her dog, and the runs in her stockings, which I'm not quite sure how they ran, but it may have been the trauma of her being attacked by a movie star. So Rinton Tin was beloved, not only in the United States, but around the world in the 1920s. He embodied a perfect sort of heroic model that no person could approach. He was silent, he was loyal, he didn't have qualities that you would react against as a person. I mean, even now, if you see a film with a character who's heroic, or even hear about a real-life hero, there's an element of judgment that we bring to other people that we do not bring to dogs. So that heroic character of the dog is one that's really endured, and I think that was uh, a large part of what Lee meant when he said there will always be a Rinton Tin. There will always be a figure of an animal with a kind of loyalty and connection and bravery and sensitivity that Rinton Tin came to embody. One of the things that I also found remarkable about Rin Tin Tin and why I think he was able to be such a huge star in the 1920s, and of course later, but I'm focusing first on that part of his life, is that he had no nationality. He was a breed of German dog found in France, made famous in America, but nobody associated nationality to him. And this was a time in the world in which those attributes were not particularly compatible. We, this was the puppy of a German war dog. He, his mother was in the German Canine Corps in World War I. So that was not an origin that you would imagine most Americans would have felt comfortable celebrating. But something about animals erase, er, simply erases those associations with nationality, obviously ethnicity, class. All of that is made moot when it comes to animals. And I think that's why we can love them the way we do. In the 1920s, and I found this fascinating because I had no idea that the American film industry began its, its world dominance in the 20s. Something like nine out of every 10 films being made in the 1920s were coming out of Hollywood. The amazing thing that I hadn't ever considered was that silent films were very easy to play around the world because they didn't need to be dubbed. All you needed to do were replace the little inner titles with the local language, and there you had it. You had no language barriers to deal with. So these Rinton Tin films were circulated around the world in the 1920s. He was an international star at a 
time when the world was not really a, a we, we were not a global community in the 1920s, but everybody knew Rintin Tin. And I'll give you a, a, I found, utterly amazing example of how this worked. And Rintin Tin made 27 silent films. The archival wisdom and technology that we now have didn't really exist in the 1920s. And also people didn't really think that film was something to be preserved. So about 80% of the silent films of that era are gone and they're irreplaceable. There, there were no copies kept. Um, in some instances during the war they were melted down and the celluloid was used to make boot heels for soldiers' boots. They, they just were not considered precious. Only eight of Rinton Tin's 27 silent films still exist. One of them, and it's one that is considered um, one of his, his greatest, and there was a tiny clip in here of him leaping off a cliff and, and then climbing a tree, and that was from that film. It's called Clash of the Wolves. It was thought to have disappeared along with all these other films. There was no record of it. Even Warner Brothers didn't keep a copy in their vaults. In the 1970s, somebody was cleaning a cabinet in an old movie theater in South Africa and found a can of film reels, and it was a copy of Clash of the Wolves that had been sent there, as were all of these films, shipped to South Africa so it could be shown there, and someone didn't get around to sending it back. Which, for any of you who have never returned a library book, you can say sometimes it works out for the best. Um, this film sat in this cabinet in South Africa for um, 50 years. Miraculously, the humidity and climate was uh, sufficient to preserve the film. And that is the one copy of Clash of the Wolves that exists. It was repatriated to the United States because there is, believe it or not, a film repatriation global treaty that if you find a film like that from another country, you return it. So it was returned. And my first reaction upon hearing this was how wonderful I get to see Clash of the Wolves. And the second thought was, how amazing to think that in the 1920s, people in South Africa were seeing an American film and seeing the landscape of the American West, seeing a vision of America that was very much a, a kind of iconic vision of this country. And we're talking about a world in which they would have had no other opportunity to even have a glimpse of the United States. And I, I just found that remarkable. So this is um, one of those, I find, very moving realizations of the way we've been connected in the world, in the world before the internet, in the world before social media that there were these connections, and, and film was certainly one of them. And I think the popularity of Rin Tin Tin was in part because he was a dog. He was a dog doing heroic, remarkable things, being loyal, attacking the bad guy, and those are universal. It doesn't have anything to do with what country this came from. Animals have always meant so much in human society. And they've also both set the pace and reflected the pace of the way we've developed. German Shepherds are a relatively new breed. They were developed in the late 1800s. And it's kind of funny because they're so familiar to us now. I assumed that they had been around forever, that they were simply the 
er dog, but in fact, they were developed in the late 1800s. There were no German shepherds in the United States in the 1900s, early 1900s. The German army had developed a canine corps of all German shepherds, um, and that was actually the intention of the man who developed the breed, was to create a, an ideal military dog. And the Germans had used more than 30,000 dogs in World War I, and they were extremely important in the war. They carried messages, they were sentries, they laid telephone wire. In some instances, they were used as suicide bombers. They had explosives strapped in their back and they were sent forward in enemy lines and the bombs were detonated. Americans came back from World War I and among the stories they came back with were stories of these amazing dogs that they had seen that the Germans used who were so smart and so strong and so capable. And it began a craze for German shepherds. Rintintin, of course, was perfectly situated to take advantage of this, and that's his stardom came about in large part because people had never seen a dog who looked like that before. There were 80 other German shepherds making movies in the 1920s. This we really don't remember any of them because most of those films are gone. There are a few around, but they were among the silent films that were melted into boot heels. But to, just to give you a sense of how important this German Shepherd iconic figure was in the 1920s, 80 other German Shepherds making movies, and they were all quite successful. Rintintin, of course, was the greatest success. He was being paid eight times what the human stars in his films were being paid, <laughs> which is another reason why people, you know, they, they couldn't say he drank, they couldn't say he cheated on his wife, so they would just complain about how he was being paid so much more than they were. So in, in Hollywood, it was the sort of thing where you would shake his hand, but then talk behind his back. <laughs> so how important are dogs in society? And I'll tell you what I find an amazing, amazing story. The Germans continued their interest in German shepherds, and even uh, after World War I, in, uh, among the various conditions of their surrender, they had to agree to disband their canine corps. But they continued secretly building it um, in spite of that, in violation of the Treaty of Versailles. One of the people who was particularly obsessed, not only with dogs, but in particular with German shepherds, was Adolf Hitler. He loved German shepherds. He always had a German Shepherd. At one point he had two, a mother and daughter German Shepherd. They were both named Blondie. I, I don't get it, why you would have two dogs with the same name. But um, the dog slept in his bed and Ava Braun slept in another bed. <laughs> the German Shepherd Club of Germany at that point had, you know, and this was the club for um, dog fanciers, had nothing to do with the military, and it had grown, and of course it was the, the, the biggest and most prominent German Shepherd breeding club in the world because that's where the dogs had originated. When Hitler came to power, one of the very first things he did was take over control of the German Shepherd Club. The man who had developed the breed was in control of the club and he resisted. He didn't want any politics associated with it. It was his life's work. He didn't want to surrender control of it to Adolf Hitler. And he was told if he didn't turn over control of the club to Hitler, he'd be sent to a concentration camp. He turned over the control. He died a year later. And the Germans 
ran the German Shepherd Club. I tried to think of what the analogy would be. It would be as if when Barack Obama became president, he took over the cockapoo club of America, or Labradoodle, or whatever kind of dog they have, Irish Water Spaniel. You know, it, it, the symbolic meaning of the German Shepherd breed and their significance as a military animal was so great that it was a priority of Hitler. And you could talk volumes about the Nazi association with animals. It's really, it, it became one of the most interesting, disturbing parts of the research of this book. Hitler famously was a vegetarian. He passed laws immediately um, upon taking power that you could no longer boil lobsters alive. You couldn't dock the ears and tails of dogs. He, he was obsessed with animal cruelty. And you can imagine you, the, the strangeness of that. The idea that your concern about the well-being of animals was so great that that was your priority. And in addition, it was written into law that Jews were considered, Jews, gypsies, gay people, considered a lower class of life form than animals. Rinton Tin was important to us as a culture in a way that is a little hard for us to appreciate now. I mean, there's still, there are dogs in movies, there are memes of animals, but the, the existence of a character like Rinton Tin, a heroic, emotional character, is something we really don't have anymore. We love dogs, we have them as our pets, we don't look up to them in the way that people did at that time. I want to read a short section from my book to you because it, it will give you, I think, another glimpse into the meaning of this animal at that particular moment in time. And we're talking now about the very first Rin Tin Tin because as you can imagine, um, a dog born in 1918 was not starring on a television show in the 1950s. If, if he had been, that would have been a whole other book about <laughs> the discovery of eternal life. But So this is um, uh, about the very first Rintintin, Tin, the original dog. He died on a warm summer day in 1932. A United Press Bulletin broke into radio programs that afternoon with the announcement, Rin Tin Tin, greatest of animal motion picture actors, pursued a ghostly villain in a canine happy hunting ground today. In his memoir, Lee's description of the event is simple. He had heard Rinty bark in a peculiar way, so he went to see what the matter was and found the dog lying on the ground. Within a moment, he was gone. The story was soon floated on the great la raft of legend. It was rumored that Rinton Tin had died at night, that he had died on the set of Pride of the Legion during a rehearsal, that he had died while leaping into the arms of Jean Harlow, who lived near Lee on Clubview Drive, that he had collapsed on Lee's front lawn and Harlow had raced over to comfort him where she, quote, cradled the great furry head in her lap and there he died. The news was met with widespread communal grief. The day after his death, an hour-long tribute to Rinty was broadcast on radio networks across the country. Quote, last night, a whole radio network and thousands of radio fans played homage to a great dog, one radio announcer explained. He was a gentleman, a scholar, a hero, a cinema star, in fact, a dog which was virtually everything we could wish to be. Theaters posted death notices in their windows as if they had lost a member of the family. Every newspaper ran an obituary and in many cases, a long feature detailing the dog's career as if his life had defined a time period that was now at an end. 
The Chicago Tribune summed up its story by saying that with Rintintin's death, the greatest of all dog actors became a memory and a tradition. Fox Movie Tone's newsreel featured a long piece about the dog's death titled Rintintin Plays His Final Role, which was the main newsreel feature following a short clip of Herbert Hoover droning on woodenly about his re-election campaign. <laughs> the footage was taken from one of Rinty's last public appearances at an orphanage in Buffalo. The orphans are smudge-faced, pale, and dressed in tattered hand-me-downs, but they light up with excitement when they see the dog. Lee tells them he will have Rin Tin Tin do some of his tricks, and he needs a volunteer. The kids shriek and bounce as Lee selects one of them, a small boy with a jagged row of dark bangs. Lee, pointing at the boy, tells Rinty to get the bad guy. Rinty pretends to attack him, and the boy's face flashes back and forth from terror to exhilaration to bashfulness. After a moment, Lee says, okay, Rinty, kiss and make up. The dog stands up on his hind legs and licks the boy's face as the kids in the audience holler in delight. Lee, watching the dog, is beaming, radiant. Then Lee calls the dog to come to him. Rinty pauses for a split second and then springs into his arms. Dark-coated, bright-eyed, he's just as slim and strong-looking as he ever was, just as light on his feet and explosive in his leap, and in Lee's embrace he looks surprisingly small, not at all like a grown dog. Holding him, Lee wears a look of joy so tender and uncomplicated that for an instant, he is transformed again into a hopeful, lonely boy. The camera lingers for a moment, and then the Fox movie tone announcer says, Rin Tin Tin, only a dog, but millions who he delighted will mourn his passing. One of the things about a dog, and certainly about Rin Tin Tin, is that we can be utterly devoted to an animal. The people who fell in love with Rin Tin Tin were absolutely devoted to him, and it is because of them that nearly 100 years after he was born, we're still talking about him. The 100 years of history that I followed felt to me like a core sampling of everything our society has gone through. It was very challenging, of course, not only because it was a huge sweep of time, but my main characters were either dead or dogs, which meant they didn't talk. <laughs> but the thing that I found so interesting was, as I said earlier, society's changes seem to be always reflected in the way rela we relate to dogs. So as I said, in 1918, when Rintintin was found, dogs were somewhat distant from us. They lived outside, they worked, they had a job. People cared about their dogs, but they were not part of the family. In fact, it was unusual during that time for dogs to live in people's homes. That's the phenomenon of dog houses, which I, don't, I really don't think even exists anymore, where your dog lived in the yard. There was a huge change then as the population began moving into cities. You would think then we would shed these animal companions. Certainly we didn't bring in chickens and goats and cows to the city but we did bring dogs. Dogs represent, and they became in that period of time and transition, very symbolic of that life that we were leaving behind. And the philosopher John Berger points to that transition as the moment that we became a modern society, when animals were no longer in our day-to-day -day lives the way they were when we were an agrarian culture. But what we did bring as that connection 
to that past were dogs. And suddenly, dogs were living with us and not simply outside. One of the things that I loved learning about in, in working on this book was the transition in the 1930s as the society was becoming more and more urbanized and people were living with their dogs in the house for the first time. Nobody knew how to train a dog. It wasn't something you did. You, when you lived on a farm, you didn't walk a dog on a leash. You maybe had the dog sit when you told it to sit, but primarily you called the dog to come, and otherwise the dog did its job, which was a somewhat instinctual thing, herding animals, for instance, or, or accompanying you while hunting. But dogs did not have manners. And they certainly didn't have the kind of manners a dog might need if it was living in an apartment building. So nobody knew how to train a dog. It's not that people in the 1930s were stupid. It's just that they did, or maybe they were, but they, this was something we had never done before. This was 20 years before the first papers on, you know, it was before Pavlov's work had been translated into English. People didn't understand um, behavioral conditioning, the way it became so familiar to us later. In the 1930s, a, a woman named Helene Walker had fallen in love with the idea of dog training, which she had been exposed to when she was in England. She decided that the greatest contribution she could make to American society was to train people to train their dogs. She and a friend converted a station wagon into a people slash dog van and traveled around the country 10,000 miles, stopping along the way and holding demonstrations to teach people how to train their dogs. This was such a phenomenon that they had thousands of people attending these events. I assume some of them were people who didn't even have dogs. It was just this amazing sight of these women with these trained poodles demonstrating that if you asked a dog to sit, it could perhaps be persuaded to sit. They even performed in Yankee Stadium. Isn't that amazing to imagine that you would perform in the Yankee Stadium the um, incredible sight of telling your dog to sit? I mean, with my dog, it would be amazing. But um, so when you look at our relationship with animals, and I, I just want to emphasize again that you can see the way society has changed through this one window. In the 1930s, for the first time, we were living with dogs inside our house. In the 1940s, those dogs that we had suddenly learned how to train we were donating to the US Army to use in World War II. In the 1950s, television appeared, and the two biggest stars instantly on television were dogs, Rin Tin Tin and his arch rival, Lassie. <laughs> it, uh, and don't even ask me about Lassie. <laughs> That's where, you know, animals are meaningful to us in, in so many ways. And certainly, as a way of looking at culture, they provide a perfect window onto a changing relationship we have with each other, with our homes, with our idea of nature, with the image of the hero. Fundamentally, though, there is something about our relationship with animals that transcends all of that, and particularly dogs. Dogs are the first domesticated animal. Scientists have established the amazing fact that dogs are genetically programmed to demonstrate empathy with humans far better than our closer relatives, like apes and chimpanzees. Dogs 
know how to connect with people. And I think that's why there's so much emotional connection that we feel. Dogs have actually evolved to be that perfect companion, to embody some need, some feeling we have about what it's like to have unconditional love. I want to read another short section from the book, and um, this, as it happens, uh, Lee Duncan was right. There will always be a Rin Tin Tin, and there are Rin Tin Tin dogs being bred now, and the fact that his story was so moving and so emotional and so symbolic in its own way that as I said, almost 100 years later, we're talking about it. And it really is a basic story about a connection and a very special kind of connection that we have with dogs. I just want to read a short section from the book um, about visiting a woman in Texas who breeds Rintintin puppies from the original bloodline. Her name is Daphne, so let me just read this to you. At the end of that hot, hot day at Daphne's house in Texas, I got ready to drive to the Houston airport for my flight back to Boston, where I was living at the time. I noticed that there was one of the puppies, and these are from a new litter of Rinton Tin puppies. I noticed there was one puppy, a tiny, dark, wide-eyed female, still sitting on Daphne's lawn, her head resting on her paws. She had been sold to a family in Boston and was going to be shipped to them the next day. As I said goodbye, Daphne realized I was heading to Boston myself, and she asked if I could take the puppy with me as hand luggage, saving her the shipping fee. I was happy to do it. She was an adorable puppy, a bit shy and worried looking, with a wrinkly brow and a whip of a tail and feet like little black paddles. She sat in a heap on my back seat during the drive from Crockett to Houston, glancing out the window and then quickly looking away. I realized that she had probably never been in a car before. After, after 30 miles or so, she started to look a little peaked, and when I stopped to let her amble around on a patch of grass behind a fast food joint, she promptly threw up and then fell asleep. On the flight home, she sat at my feet, and when she wasn't napping, she gave me a melting look that had the terrible effect of making me hope the people who had bought her had changed their minds <laughs> and that the puppy would end up staying with me. Just like that, the German Shepherd I had dreamed of as a kid, the dog I had wanted from the beginning of time, would finally, at last, belong to me. But when we landed and I carried her out to the baggage claim, the whole family was there, as of course I knew they would be, and they squealed and shrieked with excitement when they spotted me, when they spotted the puppy, that is. And they raced up and pried her out of my arms, and within a moment, they were gone, and she was gone and I was left without her, standing by the baggage carousel. I had no right to cry about it, but I couldn't help it. For that moment, at least, after a lifetime of imagining it, that shy, worried, tender, heroic, brave, gallant puppy had been mine. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks. I, I wish we had more time. Um, I know you've got a busy day of a lot of programs to go to, so I'm, um, we have time for some questions, and then I'll be signing books afterward, and I, I just want to thank you again. It's such a pleasure to be here. And we'll be passing the mics. I, I have 
this on? Yeah. I have no idea. How did Rin Tin Tin get his name? That is a great question. It was one of the things that I first researched because you think Rin Tin Tin, so what is that? Um, there's a short answer and a long answer. In World War I, there was a, a folk legend about a boy and girl named Rin Tin Tin and Nanette who survived, they were the only survivors of a bombing in Paris. They, they were considered good luck symbols and the French women and girls knitted little dolls of this boy and girl, Rin Tin Tin and Nanette, and they distributed them primarily to American soldiers as good luck charms. And they all, most American GIs had them. Lee Duncan had them. And when he found the puppies originally, and I wish I could tell you the whole long story, but he, it was, they were the only surviving animals in a dog kennel that had been hit by a bomb. So he immediately named them Rin Tin Tin and Nanette. The name Rin Tin Tin though, still, that's the origin of the association, but it's still an odd name. And it is not a nickname for something. There, it doesn't mean anything in French. The only association I could find was that it is similar to the chorus of a popular children's song. And so it was like a nonsense phrase, but it's certainly an unusual name. Lee, by the way, just uh, as a sort of poignant uh, addition to this, wore his little Rin Tin Tin and Annette dolls his whole life. He had them cast in gold when there was a period of time where he was very wealthy and then he lost all his money. It's all in the book. But he had little uh, copies of those dolls made in gold and he wore them all the time. It's a really interesting tale of, of how they came about, but it's an odd name. Yes? Uh, why do you think, um, you know, I think of, you know, Rin Tin Tin and Lassie, but I'm hard-pressed, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I can't think of any other animals in more recent years that have been stars in terms of film after film after film. Uh, why do you think that's so? Maybe I'm uh, you know, I'm sorry, I'm having a little trouble hearing that. Could anybody else? Uh, why, why is it, I, I think of... Um, you know, Rin Tin Tin and Lassie, you know, and, and being great stars. And, and correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but I'm hard pressed to think of other animals that have been stars in film after film. Right. Well, actually, um, you know, there there have been some dogs, Beethoven and Benji, but there was a big change. You know, Rin Tin Tin and Lassie were very um, noble and dignified, and they were different, but they were definitely, they were never comic. They were not cute. Lassie was, you know, certainly beautiful and cuddly, but Rin Tin Tin was never cute. He was a very serious animal, a, a kind of, like a soldier, and that was in, the, of course, the television show. The boy and Rin Tin Tin lived with a cavalry troop. The animal, there was a big change, and again, I would love to go on about this, but I was too long-winded in the beginning, but we began seeing animals more in comic roles. This was a huge change once sound came into movies. Because, of course, in silent films, a dog could be a, the protagonist, could be the star. Lee lost his contract with Warner Brothers once they decided to move into sound film. They sent him a letter saying we are um, canceling your contract because we're focusing on talkies. Everyone knows dogs can't talk. And dogs were no longer the stars. They couldn't carry a movie the way Rin Tin Tin really did. They became sidekicks, and then later they became comic. They were adorable. They were funny. They were, you know, sweet but they were never again that figure that the silent film allowed them to be, which was they were on equal footing with the people in the film. The big difference between us and animals is animals don't talk. In a silent film, no one talks. So a dog could play a role that was on par with a person in a silent film. Think of the movie The Artist. And that is a, a glimpse into probably the only time, I mean, that dog was also adorable, but he, he had the significant 
The, the film turned on the dogs taking action to go and run to, you know, pass a note between the two characters. You don't see that in, in films with talking because we just don't look at dogs as being capable in that way once conversation is part of the film. But they were, um, there has never, except for Benji, who was in a lot of movies, and I never saw any of them, but they were much more kids' movies. In the 1920s, and allow me just to go on for one more minute, Rin Tin Tin movies were not for kids only. They were for everybody. They really were adventure movies. They were action movies. He was an action figure. He was not, it was not a kid's movie. And actually, Clash of the Wolves has some fairly adult themes in it. Um, you know, it's, and everybody went. In the 1920s, they didn't have kid movies and adult movies. They had one kind of movie, and adults were very much the bigger audience. So those were not kiddie movies. Now I think if you went to a Benji movie, the only people in the audience were the parents who had to go to accompany their kids. You know, people wouldn't go to a Benji movie. Who, a grown-up wouldn't. So that's a huge difference. Adults... Many of the condolence letters that Lee Duncan got, and he got thousands and thousands of condolence letters when Rinton Tin died, they were from adults. They were not from children. There were some from children, but I included quite a few of them in the book. They were very emotional, people saying, you know, I loved this dog. He meant everything to me. I feel like, uh, you know, he represented everything that's good. I mean, they were from grown-ups who really looked up to him as a sort of model of being, not dog or human, but just this was the way to behave, to be brave, to be loyal, to be independent, to be strong. It had nothing to do with whether he was an animal or a person. And we don't, that is not a character that you see in popular culture anymore. We're going to take our last question over here. Oh, sad. <laughs> Reading your book made me want to see some of the old silent films, such as uh, Clash of the Wolves. Do you have any idea where you can find them? Yes. Uh, actually, it's sort of wonderful that you can. Um, the Library of Congress restored that print from South Africa of Clash of the Wolves, and they have it available on a DVD called treasures from the archives, the American Film Institute. And this is, um, it's a fantastic uh, collection of a lot of different, you know, they, they restore a certain number of classic films every year. Congress actually mandates this. So it's on that collection. Uh, the other ones, which are in fairly good shape, you can buy um, as DVDs, there's one source, I, I have some of them listed here, but one of them is called Grapevine Video, and they have the, the eight, well, they, they may now have Clash of the Wolves, but they had the seven others that were available, and they are, they're great. You know, when I first started watching them, I thought, oh, silent films from the 20s are going to be super boring and silly. They are almost like kabuki theater, there's so much economy of, I mean, the stories are good. Obviously, they're from a very different world, but, and the, the acting is not naturalistic. It's much more um, kind of dramatic compared to what we're used to now, but they are absolutely engrossing, the good ones. The other thing that's amazing, and I think this is partly what accounts for Rintintin's huge popularity and the love people felt for him, what you saw was what you got. There is no CGI. When he climbs a tree, he was climbing a tree. People knew that. People were, when he performed and acted, he was really doing it. So it was a, a marvel, and Lee actually toured the country and did live performances, and people just went crazy because 
they had never seen a dog do this before. And Rintinton was an incredible actor. The reason that we're talking about him and not Thunderbolt or Lightning or Flash or any of the 80 other German Shepherds of that time was that Rintinton was actually a great actor. In Clash of the Wolves, there's a scene in which he contemplates suicide. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. He has been injured. He's been cast out. He's playing a half dog, half wolf. He knows that his wife is in danger because he's weak. And he, he's had it. And he crawls to a cliff and he debates whether to throw himself off the cliff. You have to see this. And it's utterly amazing. He was, he was able to convey emotion that was quite unusual. And it, who knows how or why he had an incredible bond with Lee Duncan, and Lee somehow trained him. But the dog, that scene is utterly amazing, and it's real. It is the way he was performing, and people knew it and responded to it, and he was absolutely adored in part because of this quality of emotion that he conveyed that was almost human. So I do hope, you know, when I did my book tour originally, we played Clash of the Wolves. In fact, I, I was here in Chicago and we had a live pianist accompanying it, and it was truly wonderful. Um, and, you know, just being able to appreciate film in that state, we're, you know, not with all the bells and whistles that we see now, but something that was in a way very simple, but more complex because it had to be real. And it's a thrill to realize that it can be so engaging and that there was something real there about emotion and performance and, and drama and and just some raw feeling that you do get from these films. So I, I so encourage you to try to get them and have an opportunity to see them because they're, they're great. I'm afraid that's it. Thank you so much.